Brown, Sugar Ray Robinson, the greatest fighter ever lived. Oh, come on, man. What about Joe Lewis? The Brown Bomber. Now that was a great boxer. Who is the greatest fighter of all time? The pound for pound, all time, best ever. To me, it's easy. There's only one man in history who could do this. You're there because of the style of the opponent or whatever. Same like, move, they learned that yeah, on yeah. Saturday night. Yeah. Tattoos, Brennan. Brennan просто падает. Да. Right to the body, down Unheard of. This is an argument you see everywhere in every barber shop, no matter where you go. And I know it's subjective, but to me, one man stands out clearly who passes that eyeball test who does things that nobody's seen before, almost like a machine built to fight, almost like an alien sent down from, from up above with, with, with no kryptonite. That's why they called him Superman, Roy Jones Jr. Now, because Roy is a friend of ours, he's been on the show numerous times, people might think I'm being biased. Now, of course, I'm a little biased. You know, everybody has their favorites, but I'm gonna break down subjectively, realistically, and factually what Roy did throughout his career, which in my opinion, and many other fight fans and fighters around the world put him at the top of that food chain. So Roy Jones started his amateur career at 10 years old. He had a very successful amateur career, which all culminated in the 1988 Olympics in Seoul, Korea, where Roy blasted his way through to the finals to fight for the gold medal. The problem was, he ended up fighting against a hometown Korean in the finals. Major problem concerning Roy Leone of Italy. And again. So now one thing I want to point out that Roy did here that he didn't really carry into the pros. Roy would throw a slow kind of uh, light lead right hand at, at, at the opponent and then followed up with a lightning left hook. So the reason he would do this was he, the opponent would see the, the right hand coming slow and, and with no power, so not be worried about the power, and then see that it's coming slow. And then when Roy would follow up with that lightning fast and hard left hook, it would completely catch the opponent off guard, kind of like a bait and switch. And again. Oh, what a counter by Roy Jones. Back to Sandy Sadler, Willie Pep. Park with a counter and another left hook, although the crowd reacted to the right by Park that uh, grazed Jones. A standing and, eight. Yes, a standing eight. That's for nice. Got to try to put out Jones, your calling card, and take off right there. Ooh. And that was an emphatic calling card. He had Park staggered. I don't know what they're waiting for. That's not a standing eight. I don't know what it is. Park Sihan. Oh, that hook was so hard. Leone just about took a full step in to stop it. Coming up on 30 seconds remaining in the bottom. Now Park did connect and tried the left. And should be 15 to do it. It is all over. Roy Jones and Park Sihan. I heard the people at the couch table start yelling. I saw it, it got me. The winner is in the blue corner. Sihan has stolen the bout. The moment the bout ended, was there any doubt in your mind that you had won the fight? No, there was no doubt at all. I knew I had won the fight. I won all three rounds, clearly. Was. Now, what about when you heard that the decision was 3-2? What could I do? You I know? mean, did that worry you right away before they announced no, who I the knew, winner was? I saw all the career and something never done. I knew what they had did. But like I said, there's nothing I can do about that, you know. Uh, I think I go home, go to school, you know. I don't know if I'll box or do whatever. I don't know if I'll box or do whatever. That must have been really tough for you to, to deal with at that young age, right? Yeah, it was. It was very tough to deal with because I was the youngest guy on the team, as a matter of fact. I hear a lot of people, and it's no knock on nobody. You know, I, I, I think Floyd Mayweather is pound for pound one of the greatest fighters to ever live. But a lot of people say, well, Floyd, just like Roy, he got robbed. No, it's not like Roy. Floyd had a bloody nose. I mean, he may have won the fight. I don't know. I ain't see it, but he did have a bloody nose. Roy ain't hardly got he touched. <laughs> you understand me? By me not getting that gold medal, that would put my foot on the gas even harder. 
Now, even though Park, as you saw, landed a couple shots, Roy clearly dominated, got a standing eight, had him hurt numerous times, and should have coasted to the gold medal victory. And watching that interview always gets me because Roy literally was holding back tears in his face from the pain and the disappointment of that loss. But, as we all know, even though he said he may never fight again, he just took that and let it fuel and charge his pro career. Roy's first serious test as a pro was against Bernard Hopkins. Now, this was Roy's first breakout performance that showed the world that the guy from the Olympics is the real deal now, also as a pro. Now, remember, this wasn't the Bernard Hopkins that we got to know that was a little older, a little slower. This was the young, feisty, gritty, fast, strong Bernard Hopkins. And Roy quickly showed that he is steps above. That's why it's such a great match. Hopkins is not jabbing either. They're Here you see Roy do something that very few fighters do, a great defensive tactic. As he throws punches, he turns his head to the right. This way, he's avoiding that, that counter right hand, straight right hand or right hook, but straight right hand coming at him. And he kind of throws his hand while looking away, and it also leads his body in the motion of also just spinning and stepping away. Brilliant defensive tactic. Like the fight on the ropes. If Hopkins, weight champion ever, would you believe it? Is gaining confidence, but maybe he loses some after the right hand. Then Roy Jones. I've never seen anybody else been able to. Another thing that Roy Jones did, which people don't really remember, or talk about. You know, guys like Marvin Hagler did it. Roy Jones switched to southpaw a good amount during his fight, just to confuse his opponents. And even when he did that, the speed, the accuracy, the balance, everything was still there. Or does Hopkins have a terrific chin, Gil? No, I, I think it's a question that he hasn't hit the uh, Hopkins. Eventually, Hopkins stepped away. Here you see Roy out counter punching, the counter punching technical master of boxing, Bernard Hopkins. Those games, trying to win his. Trying to win his first world champ. Roy wins his fight, easy unanimous decision, and moves on to his next battle. His next battle, which by the way, I was at live in Vegas, was against the then undefeated, hard punching James Tony. They were both champions, both undefeated. This fight had all the makings. I mean, this fight was, was as big as Hagler Hearns. I mean, this fight was huge at the time because it was such a 50-50 split. People didn't know if Roy's speed and amazing footwork and, and unhuman reflexes would be too much or if James Tony's unbelievable power and defensive ability would be too much. It had everybody on the edge of their seats. And, and Jim, uh, you know... So the one thing that Roy did which was paramount in this entire fight against James Tony, was the way that he would step to the right. So he did this because when James Tony got into his famous Philly shell kind of defense, James Tony would, would, would lean and almost kind of turn his back, right, toward the opponent or towards Roy. So what Roy would do was Roy would throw some shots, know that James is going to lean, pop up, and then Roy would just jump and spin around him spin around him and then all this side body head would be open and Roy would, would throw and then keep spinning boom 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 going around and around James would almost be following him uh, almost made to be dizzy and off balance and it was something that Roy used beautifully throughout the fight and, and Jim uh, you know James was right. counterpunch but James, James was more aggressive counterpuncher the thing about James and what people don't understand is James, before I became pound pound, James was pound pound the best fighter fighting. And the one, th one thing you have to know about James is that you cannot stand directly in front of James. If you stand directly in front of James, you gonna, he gonna eat your lunch. You yeah. can't stand in front, you gotta go around him. If you don't go around him, he gonna eat your lunch. It's simple as that. Here you see Roy Jones do something that very few, few people can do. Roy is so fast that he's able to shoot off the one-two before James Tony can react with his famous pull counter. 
and then Roy does something very smart. He shoots the one-two, and then he gets right in the chest of James Tony, right up close, giving James Tony no room to actually shoot that punch forward. against Bernard Hopkins a few fights Punch back. Get out. Pressure, physical and mental. On Jones and Jones. And the left hook over. got behind the guard. Here Roy Jones does something for the very first time and something that has never been done before since then. He knocks James Tony down. This happens because James Tony tries to showboat along with Roy and Roy as he's done all fight leaps in and catches James with a sharp left hook. Now to be fair, this was more of an off-balance thing because Roy's body following through, going with what I was saying, how he likes to get in James's chest after he punches to avoid counters, he, him bumping into James Tony's chest, that momentum kind of causes a lot of the knockdown as well. But nevertheless, it's still a clean knockdown. Showboating by Jones. The attempt to fade, think. Left hook have another angle that we can see it here it'll tell us right now you see his again what talking does it do you a bit of good thickness and defense and i was at the Roy Jones fight like at at the actual fight in vegas why do you think he never gave you a rematch he he didn't want one. sorry stupid question my bad. <laughs> bad he didn't want a rematch what, what, James, was, was Roy the fastest guy you've ever been in there with? I was the more, the more, the more fastest than motherfucking speaking Gonzalez. <laughs> <laughs> hey, good box skills. Hey, I, 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 uh, I can't see no bad about Roy, but Roy's a good fight. He, 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 was, he was the best man that night. Tony pretending not to be hurt, but he's wobbled. Here you see Roy do something. He's done his whole career, even as, as an amateur. He dips down for a second. Faking out the opponent, thinking he's going to go low to the body. Then he leaps in with that lightning fast left hook up top. So it's not out of the question again. But again, the, again. Solid left. Tony in a little bit of trouble. The doxy. Now, James Tony did land some shots. And he landed a couple shots. Solid, flush, real hard shots on Roy, but it did nothing. You know, Roy's chin in his prime, especially at that at that natural 168, his natural weight was excellent. It just wiped right off. <laughs> wiped right off. A couple of times during the fight, Larry. Not seriously, but hurt. How about now? How about Again, right now? He's just being completely overwhelmed. And I think a left hook to the body hurt James Tony. Who's the best fighter you ever fought? Who would you put as like the most talented? James Tony by far. James Tony by far. Roy Jones, his prime had a hard time hitting James Tony. You hear me? If I could hit him, I know the rest of them were hard to hit him. James Tony in shape, hard to deal with. I was yeah. having a hard time getting Definitely. James Tony. And I knew, and I knew he struggled with the weight, and I knew he wasn't the the the, the at his. What he thought was the best, he, but as far as skill for skill goes, that's one of the toughest guys, one of the smartest, best boxer, wow. best fighter I've ever seen in my life. Tony Badly to set this up. And Jones comes back with a fury. Right near the end of the fight, in this 11th round, Roy does something that most people didn't catch, but to me, it seemed pretty obvious. He hurts Tony, almost, make, almost has him go down. He catches Tony with a counter, with that left hook counter, right as Tony's throwing his own punch, which are the ones that get you, the ones you don't see while you're throwing your own shot. Or there are a lot of people who bet on him. Or there are a lot of people who bet on him. One minute to go. Roy ends up coasting to the unanimous decision victory and claiming that pound for pound title for the best in the world at the time. Roy's next fight is one of my personal favorites and one of the most dominant performances in boxing history. Roy goes up against former 135-pound champion, 140-pound champion, also a fellow stablemate of me and Jeremy at Kevin Rooney's camp, 
the Pasmanian Devil, Vinny Pazienza. Predominantly for oh, big left hook by Jones. So now Roy has the distinct honor of being one of the few guys that actually can throw the amount of combos that you see that guys do on the hand pads. He can actually do that in fights. He's one of the few guys. So now here, prompted by Vinny Pazienza trying to showboat against Roy, kind of, you know, overshadow Roy, who's the king of showboating. Roy gets irritated by this, and Roy throws his second highest count combination of all time. Roy unleashes a 16-punch lightning-fast combination on Vinny. Another amazing thing Roy did for the first time was he worked his jab. Roy had such unbelievable skill that he didn't have to fight traditional. He didn't always lead with a jab. He didn't set things up with the jab like almost all fighters have to do. Roy did what he wanted, but in this fight, Roy decided to work the jab, and it kept Vinny Pazienza at bay where Vinny couldn't even touch him. Under the left side. His hands are low, he's getting nailed by Jones. One or two punches, and they were heavyweights. Certainly not guys down at this level. And he only threw five. Jones is going in too hard. He's going to go side to side. He, he leaped before. What is a lump? And the, the double and triple jabs of Jones are keeping him off. Oh, huge. An astonishing statistic from the last round. Vinny Pazienza threw five punches, landed none. It's the first time in CompuBox history that that has happened over an entire round ever since punches have been counted by that organization. An amazing statistic. Wow. I wasn't losing rounds when I was on top. You hear me? I know. I know fights. I wasn't losing rounds. Rounds. I know. But you can't tell people that because ah, they're caught up in the grit, the fame, the money. They're caught up in all the other stuff except the real facts of boxing. First person ever in company box history to go a whole round without getting hit. Fighting another dude who was a bad dude because he came, he won belts from 135 all the way to 168. And that's Vinny Pazenza. You won a whole round with the Pazmanian devil and didn't get touched. A whole only person in company box history to go a whole round and don't get touched. But they say, oh, <laughs> this one's the best defensive fighter of all time. Really? Well, why he don't want to ever win a whole round without getting touched? does something which he does again later on in his career. This is the first time we see it. He is dominating Vinny Pazienza so thoroughly that he looks over at the ref and he's like, you really want me to finish this off? And he does the famous shrug of the arms like, okay, I'll give you what you're making me do here. And he proceeds to finish the fight off in spectacular fashion. His health and safety here because he's tired and he is wide open. Who would you say, though, was the be best fighter you fought when you fought them? Like, who, the person where you're like, Jesus, this, this guy has the most skill that I've seen, or the best fighter I've seen. Right, right Jones. Right, Jones. He was just, he was, he was unbelievable. He was, he was Mayweather at that time with power. I'm fighting, I'm fighting this guy who's the fucking greatest in the planet at the time. Yeah. I, I walk, I walk to the ring and... Only, only five times, like how, how coincidental is that? Five times, the five times I walked to, to fight and I walked to the ring and I said, please God, let me live after this fight, please. This fight wasn't really talked about as much uh, as it should have been. You know, I guess mostly because his opponent, Brian Brandon, wasn't really that well known, but don't forget, Brian Brandon was undefeated coming into this fight tough, hard-hitting guy. But why I bring it up is because, one, I was at that fight. It was at, at the time, the Paramount Theater at Madison Square Garden. Now it's called, I think, the Hulu Theater at Madison Square Garden. Um, but two, 
It was one of Roy's most spectacular performances. He looked wicked. So here you see how Roy throws a light kind of left hook to start and kind of lull Brian to sleep and then follows with a with a lightning fast hard left hook which drops him. У него нет никакой возможности отвечать такой машине, как Рой Джонс. Он получает по полной. So here you see Roy do what he just did with Vinny Pazienza with Brandon. Roy was was dominating the fight so severely uh, that he didn't want to see the opponent hurt. You know, Roy famously would hold back in some fights because he was actually worried about his opponent's safety. Uh, Roy was was uh, close with with Joe McClellan, and famously was really affected after Joe McClellan received the brain injuries uh, with his fight against Ben. I remember hearing you said a while back that you didn't want to visit Gerald McClellan until you you retired. Have you ever did you ever end up going to visit him, or was it still too too tough? I talked to him. I talked to him a couple times. I talked to him once on Facetime with uh, with his son. Uh, yeah. You know, it's a hard pill to swallow, man. When you know somebody like that, it's a, it's a hard, I have a soft heart when it comes to people already. And uh, it's very hard for me to, to, to stomach things like that. It was hard for me to stomach it when I talked to him with his son on FaceTime. It was very hard for me to stomach that. You know what I mean? It's just, that's a very tragic thing for me. And it's very hard to to just to see a person that's they, that you knew from way before they were like this. Like, ah, it's just hard for me to do that. Um, so Roy was always looking out for the health of his opponent as well. So here he tells the referee again, you really want me to do this? You really want me to do this? Like, stop the fight, do your job. The referee said no, and Roy just had to jump in and finish business and do what he was there to do. Roy's next fight of note was against legendary fighter from Jamaica originally, Mike McCallum. Now, Mike was a legend in boxing. He was the welterweight champ of the world. He was a middleweight champ of the world. He was also the light heavyweight champ of the world. And Roy came in, made easy work out of Mike, but again, like we just talked about with, with uh, Brian Brandon and with Vinny, Roy held back slightly with McCallum because he didn't want to hurt the legend. And, of course, afterwards, Roy's critics criticized him severely for holding back. Well, I remember back in 89, Harold Graham facing Mike McCallum for the vacant WBA minute. I know a lot of focus has been put on Roy's offense, but here I want you to check out his defense for a second. Roy, a lot of times, would use the kind of arms out forearm defense to kind of pick pick shots off while he moves his head at the same time and moves his forearms and catches a lot of those punches up here. Very similar to what George Foreman used to do. The younger Foreman, the older Foreman came back, was doing the cross body defense, but the older Foreman would keep his forearms up. He had such long arms. Um, that it was very effective, and Roy is the same way. You see him here doing this against Mike McCallum. McCallum cross swords with iron Steve Collins. He ran in down. Although he's making good shot again from Jim. And again, Jones. And McCallum there forced with. Oh! He's down! Oh! Well, how did he keep his feet then? Jones has skated it. Roy's next fight was relatively low profile, uh, no, which is no disrespect to Montel Griffin, because he is a, a friend of ours, great fighter. That's just more testament to how great Roy was at the time. They, they thought nobody could beat him. Um, but we quickly saw this fight take a very different turn for Roy. And you can see that in the very beginning of the fight, Roy comes out to a song that he wrote and rapped. Roy, for those who don't, y'all must have forgot. Roy was also rapped um, back then. He was also releasing albums and stuff. 
the song that he wrote and rapped as he enters the ring against Montel was called Patience is a Virtue. And now Roy Jones will enter the ring to his own musical composition called Patience is a Virtue. A reminder to him that he wants to be patient in the ring against the crafty Griffin tonight. And it was a testament to Roy wanting to take this fight and partially because he was so bored beating people so easily, he made a challenge and he said to himself, I am going to take Montel Griffin, who beat Jeremy to qualify for the Olympic team. That's a whole different story. The winner, the score, 33 to 8. And joining the team of Olympians to go to Barcelona, your winner, Montel Griffin. I Sim was like to Jeremy, like that must sting because of the Olympics. You know what I mean? Like you guys fought off, fought it off in the finals and no. Yeah, man, I wasn't. I wasn't trying to bring that up. You know what I'm saying? Well, I mean, Jeremy's cool with it. Yeah. I'm cool. Hey, man, yeah. shit, there's water on the bridge now. Yeah. Sorry, but Montel, who was a great fighter, but a a, a, a very very good counter puncher, Roy said to himself, "I'm going to do this. I am going to throw a couple feints, throw a couple distractions, and force Montel to counter me, and I'm going to counter his counter." I made a song that said patience was the virtue because I knew that Montiel was a counter puncher just like I am. So, like, I kept telling my coach, I just got to wait him out. You know what I mean? Take him in the deep water. He'll tire. Then I'll get him. His low crouching position. And he catches a guy. With... Now, while Roy did this to challenge himself and spice things up and make it interesting, I think he got more than what he bargained for because Montel started off winning a lot of those opening rounds. Anderson, don't try to reach me. I have an a lot of fainting, a lot of fainting, not too much punching. Massaging his arms after the first round as well as So here you see one of the tactics in Montel's counter punching which made it so effective. He would wait for Roy to throw and then immediately after Roy was done with his combination, Montel would throw a shot catching Roy kind of right at the very tail end of Roy's own combination. Well, there's one right here. Punches, it's scoring points for Griffin. Good left hook by Griffin. Jones, Griffin backs out. So although Roy was having some trouble up to this point, he's now starting to find a home for that straight right hand. Another Griffin. His white trunks with black trim. There's a Any different. Ducks away from the right hand there. The left hand put him straight on the canvas. So Montel Griffin got hit. So after landing another one of those counters, immediately following Roy's flurry, Montel does something that shows his, his, his real experience. He's been a gym rat for his whole life. While they're clinched, Montel quickly bumps Roy off with like a shoulder shrug, a shoulder push. And then as Roy's going back, Montel hits him. Now, this is borderline legal, borderline not illegal, but it's still a very crafty veteran move. That's a right across the top and then immediately cut. Shooting a blank cap pistol. Jones nailed him pretty good that time. So now, the most controversial thing to that point at Roy's career happens. Roy, as we said before, was, was, was closing in on landing those straight rights. He lands a vicious straight right. Looked like he went down and tried to fake almost coming in with a left hook, but instead fired the straight right, which caught Montel. Vicious straight right landed and wobbled Montel. Roy jumped on, applied pressure, and then Montel, to clear his head, and before getting hit again and, and, and possibly not being able to get up, he decides to take a knee to clear the cobwebs. When Montel takes his knee, Roy fires off two shots at Montel. And to this day, there's two sides of the story. Roy's side 
of why he did it and why he it was a he did it uh, cleanly and with no uh, ill intentions or Montel's side. It was a frustrated man attacking him. Right hand lead again, and a couple of left hooks. And Griffin's knee goes down, and Jones lands two punches after Griffin's knee was on the can. In his prime, when he was considered the greatest fighter in history, pound mm -hmm. for pound, mm -hmm. I was beating him. I was beating him fair and square. Uh, I told Roy. I said, Roy, I said, your fans love you so much that you hit me when I was on my knee, and they hate and they hate me because you hit me. Do you think that he really hit you because he knew what he was doing? Or do you think that because you were a low to the ground fighter, he wasn't, you know, he didn't. First, first of all, first of all, you got to remember one thing. He didn't knock me down. I no. took a knee. Mm -hmm. So why, how, why would he, why would he hit me then? I mean, he didn't knock me down. So well, why would he walk up to me? And any, he, and he loaded up the second point. He hit me twice. Mm -hmm. He loaded up the second point. So, I mean, it's it just crazy. There's some things I'm going to have to live with for the rest of my life. He knew what he was doing. Yeah, he knew. He was frustrated. That's, he was frustrated. Yeah. Uh, I, talked to, I talked to guys in this camp, and they told me. Uh, you know, friends of his, friends of his that I'm cool with, like, man, he was frustrated. Mm -hmm. So he had never been in the ring with a guy he, never, he couldn't hit. And a couple of left hooks. And Griffin's oh, knee goes oh. down. And Jones lands two punches after Griffin's knee was on the camp. Uh, only thing was when he went down, he didn't go down from a punch, and the referee didn't say stop. So I'm not allowed to back away from you because if you come down, I turn my back, you hit me and knock me out. The referee gonna count me out because the referee never said stop. So when he went down. I'm thinking, okay, you gonna say something? So I tap him. The referee still ain't saying nothing. And if you think about it, you look, I tap him first. The referee ain't said stop yet. Then I hit him again because the referee ain't said that. I'm not gonna leave. He five seven, five six. I don't know. I can't look down and see if it's knee or down or not. I don't care. I know you didn't go down from a punch. So until the referee tell me to stop, I supposed to go. It wasn't like I was trying to do no damage to him or nothing. It wasn't that kind of thing. Me. So as you can imagine, Roy immediately opts for a rematch to prove to everybody that he is still the best pound for pound fighter in the world. But now for the first time, some people had some doubts. Can a crafty boxer beat the unorthodox, untraditional Roy Jones? This fight, Roy does something we've never seen. He comes straight at Montel. No boxing, no technique. He's just coming at him to take his head off. The first time, it will be true again the second time. And of course, Griffin believes that he thrives and will continue to thrive on being underestimated. Jones lands a solid left hook. Let me tell you, that first left hook hurt Griffin. And so does the second one. And Mercanti calls it a knockdown. About Roy Jones's left hook leads. Jones lands another left fainting game, and Griffith is benefiting by it. Whoa, what a left hook. What a left hook. Second Over knockdown of the round. Hook. That was a leaping left hook, and Griffin may not survive it. He's got trouble. Nine. And that's that. Jones gets his vindication via a first round knockout. I usually don't show post-fight interviews, but this is one of the most gangster displays of, of sincerity really coming from the heart, from deep within, that I've ever seen come out of any fighter's mouth. Roy Jones still number one and gonna be that way, baby. big for all these doubters. Him and all of us that think Roy Jones is a fluke, now they know. Now, nah, back to where I am. I am redeemed. I deserve to be back pound for pound number one because I am. It's just like that. I don't even want to hear nothing else. I should be pound for pound the best. I don't want to have to do this, but they make Why didn't you want to have to do this? Because I don't like trying to hurt people. No, not I was out here trying to hurt that kid. If I would have got a chance, I would have killed that kid by mistake. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to do that. That's not my intention. My intention is to come out here and do good things and be done with it. That's why I don't like that old Roy Jones. You don't want to pull the RJ out. I don't want to see the right, RJ. Did you, did you need this kind of incentive didn't I just to say bring that? out 105 percent of yourself. Didn't I just say that? That's what it takes some time. You take something from me, I'm coming to get it back. I don't care if you take it from me. This honestly, I'm coming to get it back. Now, if you beat me, you beat me. We had a good night. I'm still gonna come get it back. But if you take it this honestly, I'm coming to get it. All right. So you came out here with a totally different intention you than you it. did the first fight. You saw it. I went out here to box to get y'all on show, and I ain't want to give you too much to criticize me. But I had to come on and do my thing. You understand? I ain't gonna let you talk. I did the talking tonight. Roy Jones, Pensacola, we talked tonight. The Gulf Coast, Mississippi, all that, we talked 
tonight. The best man fight, the best fight in the world, pound for I talk tonight. Understand what I'm saying? I don't want to hear nothing else. There was no, no, no need for this, you know what I'm saying? I shouldn't have to come in and try to go at that guy and try to do that, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I feel bad for him now because it's embarrassment to him in a way, and he has a family too, you know? I'm not that kind of Are guy. you? Yeah, the rematch, man, I wasn't allowed to warm up. Uh, I, was the, I was the world champ. I wasn't allowed to warm up. It was, it was crazy. You know, it's people, it, it was witnesses there. People seen what happened, but mm -hmm. it is what it is. I got to live with that for the rest of my life, man. For his next fight was against a legend. Virgil Hill, North Dakota zone. He was a silver medalist in the 84 Olympics, former light heavyweight champion, linear light heavyweight champion, and former cruiserweight world champion. They get in the ring. Virgil Hill had only lost, I think, twice at this point, close decisions, and Roy does something that has never been done before to Virgil, and you rarely see him boxing. Not aggressive, not waiting to see what Jones is going to do. Quick left hook up top. By Jones lands a right hand flush on the cheek. Another right hand, and Jones is starting to get it going. Another right hand lands for Jones. Hill has taken all the power shots pretty well so far. Now there's the combination. Hill lands a right hand over the top in retirement. Oh. Oh. Right to the body, down Unheard goes. Unheard of. Only the third time Hill's ever been down. And Steinwinder's in the fight. First time Virgil Hill's ever been knocked out. Roy punched hard. But he always punches hard at the very beginning, and he fades at the end. Oh. So if I could if I could have got out of that, if I could have got this guy has never thrown a body shot one till me. <laughs> he goes, and he threw a body shot and busted my rib. Oh goodness. Did you break yeah. it? Did your was your rib broken? It, he cracked it. Damn. Not the same thing as broke, but he cracked it. Yeah. And uh, I remember, you know, I threw a shot and missed, and I turned like this, and he came back, and boom. And now I, I would have said that it was a, a fluke thing had I not seen the fight, and then I saw he, what him and his coach talked about. He said, go to the body. And, stuff, and I was like, oh, shit, okay. That was good. That was that was, that was was legit. So, so Roy's point were were more hard than they were snappy, or were snappy and fast. No, 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 no. He had snappy fast too because he busted my eardrum the first the first round. Wow. He swooped the hook and popped my ear like this, and it went pop and it tore my eardrum. Look, I'm telling you, if I get out of that round and stuff like that, I haven't. Yeah. Yeah, because you can't you can't get past my jab. It was too fast. Silencing the critics who say Roy is all speed and no power. Roy knocks out Virgil Hill with a body shot. One body shot. Hill can't continue. As George Foreman said, it was unheard of. And another thing unheard of, which Roy does a few fights later against tough Glenn Kelly. Roy Jones puts his hands behind his back and then throws a knockout blow and knocks Kelly out. Doesn't hurt him, doesn't drop him, puts his hands behind his back and proceeds to knock him out. We're not carrying you there because of the style of the opponent or whatever. Shane Mosley learned that on Saturday night. Again. We're not carrying you there because of the style of the opponent or whatever. Shane Mosley learned that on Saturday night. Again. Once again. Third knockdown of the night. Who never saw it. <laughs> in his next fight, Roy tries to make history. He wants to fight for the heavyweight championship of the world, be the first fighter in over a hundred years since 1897 to go from middleweight champion all the way to heavyweight champion in the same career. Last guy to do this was Bob Fitzsimmons. Bob Fitzsimmons was a bad man. He had the deadly solar plexus punch, where he would nail guys right in the solar plexus and they crumble. And that's exactly how he won the world heavyweight title, Bob Fitzsimmons, in 1897, crumbling Cor James J. Corbett with that exact punch. The fight against John Ruiz for the heavyweight championship of the world starts off as you would expect. Roy was moving, sticking and moving. His, his amazing speed was just dominating and overwhelming Ruiz. However, 
there's this one exchange in the beginning where Ruiz actually lands a couple shots and you see the light bulb click in Roy's head like, okay, I was knocking out middleweights and light heavyweights, but this guy's naturally a lot bigger than me. So then Roy, as the brilliant fighter he was, stops, adjusts, and continues boxing, keeping himself in minimal danger. Kirk Johnson, Roy Jones. You don't wait for a little guy. Huge weakness in his arsenal. Solid left hook. And Ruiz comes back with his own left hook. And lands a left in return. And they're fighting. Watching and waiting for something good to happen. There's a solid right cross by Jones. Ooh! He's not his hurt. He stunned him. Looks like Jones is starting to fight more like this. Place. <laughs> <laughs> outclassed opponents. He's gone to do what he wants to do. And Jones is in the way. The new WBA heavyweight champion of the world, Roy Jones Jr. Then it hit me on a dream one night. Maybe you should go fight for the heavyweight championship of the world. And if I did it in 106 years, why not you? You know, that would be history-making. Then I think Bernard made history by having the most middleweight defenses of all time. I said, now, if he can make history, that means, you know, you got to go make history now because yeah. you beat him. How are you going to let him make history and you not? <clears throat> so, I said, yeah. so I went to Atlanta. People don't know this story. I went to Atlanta, asked Holyfield to fight. Him and his guy were like, no, nah, we got too much to lose and not enough to get. Y'all got two? Okay. All right. I said, okay, I respect that. And I left. Lo and behold, John Reese beats Holyfield next fight. And I don't know how he knew that I want to fight for the title, but he said, I'll fight Roy Jones. What? You do? <laughs> okay. I let that is. I mean, you know, when God speaks, you gotta listen. So, you know, I'm like, there it is. So that's what happened. Roy is now the heavyweight champion of the world. And he is pondering retirement. He's pondering walking away into the sunset. But there is a thorn in his side that shows up at the press conference. Somebody from Florida, the same state as he's from, biting at Roy's heels for a long time. How much do I have to go through? Who do I have to beat in order for me to get my opportunity at history? I'm going to give him. Before I retire, his ass is mine. Antonio Tarver and Roy are about the same age, but Antonio Tarver went through some personal problems and had didn't turn pro till he was 28, 29 years old, while Roy, by that point, had already reached high levels. So even though they're the same age, Antonio Tarver was way fresher, with way less mileage on his body. Never one to back down from a challenge, Roy decides to do something that has only been done once. Winning the heavyweight title, winning the light heavyweight title, winning the heavyweight title, then going back down and regaining the light heavyweight title. So Roy decides to clash with Antonio Tarver. But don't forget, very important here, this is physics, this is science, this is biology. Roy had gained 25 pounds of muscle on his 5'11 frame, pure muscle, to fight Ruiz for the heavyweight championship. And then within months, he has to lose all of this weight, this 25 pounds, but of muscle, way different than losing fat or water weight. He had to lose 25 pounds of muscle within months to make the weight to try and reclaim the light heavyweight championship. And now Carver lands another left, goes twice to the back. Jones blocking shots with his arms. That's going to miss you. He lands the left hand right through the middle of the goal. So from the very first round, you can see Roy sluggishness, Roy's lack of energy, how he just lays up against the ropes and lets Tarver fire off on him. And something seems very off because Roy has a tendency to back up to the ropes a little bit throughout his career, but nowhere near as much as this. Stays on balance, does his puncher and gets right out of there. Lands two more left hands right through the middle of Jones's guard. Jones's nose has been red. Roy Jones has been hit very hard. Look at Tarver banging away with the left hand and landing them again. This time coming around. Hasn't gotten off and 
Jones is beginning to punch it up in those middleweight division. And there's the first jumps out of the corner. And Tarver drives him back into the ropes again. Using up his energy he's here. Not at all. Straight right hand lands for Jones as he leaps in and then jumps right on past Tarver out of punching range. Hands. Once again, Jones on the ropes. Once again, Tarver. Roy starts. Picking up the pace now, getting a second win and figuring some things out. You see his speed is still there. Even though he's a little older and even though he's drained, he still has a speed and is starting to touch Tarver. But also, Roy's starting to do a couple things. Roy's starting to throw that jab, and then Tarver had, had uh, the way Tarver would, would defensively move, he would kind of lean back at the waist, so he would get his, his head out of, out of range because he's so tall, but his body would be open. So Roy would throw that jab, to make Tarver move back and expose his body, then Roy would come across with the right hook to the body. Another thing Roy started doing, still having that speed, um, is he would wait for Tarver to jab, and then he would throw his own left hook over the jab to counter, and then Tarver would do that lean back because he sees punches coming, and then Roy would throw the butt, the right hook to the body. So it would be the left hook over the top, that would, that would catch Tarver, get Tarver going back defensively, and then the right hook to the body. And he started landing those throughout the whole rest of the fight. A guy, even when you can't do anything, make him afraid to do something himself. And Jones has made enough of a statement in rounds three and four. These jabs don't have authority, but they start to land again. Jones's body shot. Jabs don't have authority. They start to land again. As I mentioned, hot shotting. A good athlete, period. As Roy he, Jones is trying to make Tarver expel some of his energy because he's not in the great energy uh, position himself. And there's a huge right. Tarver landed that left hand shot. Jones clowned a little bit. Carl Jones sneers contemptuously at him. Finally got confidence to throw that straight. There it is. Left, left hand by Joe. There it is. There it is. Another hard left hand. And Tarver lets his hands go again. Is that Jones has always made mistakes in the ring that other fighters couldn't take advantage of. A high energy level as Tarver bangs him again with a straight left. All night long he's been waiting for that left. Now that straight left hand is right. is taking big shots. Big shots. Gives up. Recognizes he's not going to win. In this occasion, Jones has to come late rounds and he's doing it. What a performance. Now the greatness that he needs to hold off Antonio Tarver. Now the combinations begin to flow. Now Roy Jones becomes... We've all, we've all wondered how Roy would react to adversity. He is reacting like a champion now. Can Antonio Tarver solidify the light hate heavyweight championship of the world? Can he not? Roy Jones out. Jones is hurt, but he's fighting. High drama. Big right hand by Jones. When a boxer like Roy gets older, perhaps a little bit slower, we start to see what intangibles he has inside of him not just the pure athletic ability. Tonight, it's clear, fighting Antonio Tarver. Roy Jones has dug deep and has found the best within himself in these last six. After 12 long, hard-fought rounds, an exhausted Roy Jones pulls out the decision victory. Now, most people gave Roy the win, but there were some doubters and there was some controversy and it left both Roy and Antonio Tarver in a bit of a limbo. You know, the first fight, of course, it was a lot of controversy, but 
when you feel like it, you know, you did everything you were supposed to do and and they I just felt like blatantly rob you, bro. You feel like you your house been broken into. You know what I mean? You feel right. like you're violated in the worst way. That first fight with Tarver was the first time people got an opportunity <clears throat> to see ever seen a lot of people. And that was a chance to see that I had a heart. You understand? When the chips were all against me, I had no energy. I had nothing. Everything was against me. And I had a well-trained man in front of me that, that, that idolized me and couldn't wait for his opportunity to beat me his whole career. Coming at me, and I still beat him. So after this fight, everybody demanded a rematch. Antonio Tarver did. You know, and even though Roy had hinted at retiring after the Ruiz fight, He's the kind of person that if anybody at all doubts that he, if he could do something, he's going to prove him wrong. Didn't matter that he was, you know, older. Didn't matter that he had a lot of boxing mileage on his body. He had to prove him wrong or he, or he couldn't sleep. But I'm the kind of person that is that if you think somebody could beat me, I'm not going to go to sleep and not find out. You feel? So people are like, well, you know, he gave you a hard time, which he did, but it's because of the weight loss. So do you think that him losing all the weight from heavy coming back down, do you think that played a part? Like, because that was his, obviously, his side. No, I don't think it played a part. You asking me that question, bro. The whole thing was no excuses. That was the whole thing. And then Jeremy Williams, no, man, everybody lose weight. That's harder to get. You think I wasn't losing weight? You mm. think I wasn't losing as much weight as Roy, bro? And it's hard to lose that weight. Do that. He found it out when he had to lose that weight after doing the Rocky movie and fight. But no, it happens after that. He found the same thing to be true. So it was no excuse, it was the fact. Which, which leads us to another conversation. We all know that Roy, at the end of his career, amassed a, a few losses, some of them by knockout, and he was never really the same fighter after he fought Tarver. The question is, when you rank all-time greats, what I rank Roy Jones as the, the greatest fighter ever, pound for pound. Now, that's only for what he's done in the ring. Muhammad Ali can be greater if you're computing what he did outside the ring. You know, Sugar Ray Robinson could be greater if you're computing all the fights he had. You know, Chavez, the undefeated streak before finally losing was like 89-0 or 91-0 might have been. I look at the fighter in their prime, and the prime does have to be lengthy. Mike Tyson had a prime, was amazing, but his prime was only about four years. Tyson, after he lost to Douglas, he was never the same either. Roy Jones had about a 10-15 to 15 year prime. And when you, he passed what I call the eyeball test. Everything you saw Roy do was almost superhuman. No fighter was as fast as Roy. No fighter was as strong as Roy. No fighter was able to move like Roy. Um, and no fighter since Bob Fitzsimmons 100 years ago was able to win as many titles from middleweight all the way up to heavyweight like Roy did. Mm -hmm. No other fighter on planet Earth that has dead or alive has ever turned pro as a junior middleweight and became heavyweight champ of the world. What more do you need mm. to say? No other fighter ever. What more can yep. you say? And there's some great fighters. Yep. This man right here was a great fighter. There's some great mm. fighters in the world. I'm not saying that. I'm not knocking nobody about nothing. But what other man can you ever say, dead or alive, that turned pro as a junior middleweight and became heavyweight champ of the world? The great Sherry Robinson passed out trying to become the light heavyweight champ of the world. He was a welterweight, but he tried to become the light heavyweight champ, and he passed out. And mm -hmm. I mean, it ain't, it, ain't, it ain't an easy feat. Yeah. The debate over who's the best pound pound fighter is it can last all day long. Everybody has their own criteria. It, it's a fun but layered debate. Roy Jones, besides the skill, the, 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 the optics that he presented with his unbelievable speed and power and unorthodox movement and all that, you know, the biggest criticism on Roy is two things. One, that he ended up losing some of his fights at the end of his career by knockout, which to me does not erase his domination for the 15 years up until he was 35, um, from 20 to 35, he dominated. And, you know, 35, again, at his age, it was, a, it was an old 35. He had been boxing for a long time. There was a lot of mileage on him. And he had gone up and down in weight, you know, and drained himself. But also another criticism is that he didn't fight anybody which to me is insane. I've laid out here. This man has beat numerous Hall of Famers throughout his career. Bernard Hopkins, James Toney, Vinny Pazienza, Mike McCallum, Felix Trinidad, Virgil Hill, 
the list goes on. He definitely deserves a place in the all-time greats. We often wonder what could have been. What would have happened if Rocky Marciano had a couple more fights? What would have happened if Richard Steele didn't stop that fight against Meldrick Taylor and Julio Cesar Chavez? What would have happened if Roy Jones would have stopped fighting after he beat Ruiz? We'll never know what would have happened. So if, if you could do something different, I won't, would you do anything different at the end of your career? Well, because of the way they do, you know, because of the way they talk about you now, I would have said after I won that first title fight, I would have quit. 